let's start all the way at the beginning. Who are the Samaritans? We are on top of Mount Gerizim, which is the holy mountain for the Samaritan. It is also significant for Jews and Christians. We keep the oldest Bible, we keep the oldest language, we keep the, our custom, and we have everything original. We really try to build a good connections with the Jewish people because we believe we do share the same faith and the same origins, and we have the same goal, to live peacefully in the lands of our fathers. We all know the story of the Samaritans in the New Testament. Yeshua brings the story of the Good Samaritan when he talks about love your neighbor as yourself. He knew the debate in the Jewish mind about who is your neighbor. And Yeshua comes and he takes the commandment and he elevates the commandment to a very high level. And then he tells them the story of the Good Samaritan in order to show that we need to love our enemy. Because at that time, the Samaritan were considered a religious enemy to the Jewish people. And then he asked them, and you all know the story, and he says, so who is your neighbor? And Yeshua says, you're commanded to love those that you consider as enemy. Meeting the Samaritans today, 2,000 years later, gives us a peek into history, a peek into an ancient language, into an ancient people, understanding the whole concept of sacrifices. Let us watch together the Samaritans. It's easy to forget just how diverse Israel actually is. Anyone you pass by on the street could be from an ethnicity or a people group you might have never even heard about. And some of these people go back thousands upon thousands of years. We have Druze and Arabs and Christians and Maronites and Assyrian Christians. We have just so many people groups in this land. And one of the most amazing and incredible and interesting groups are the Samaritans. Their story is nothing short of incredible. Christians are familiar with the term, the Good Samaritan. Christians don't always realize that the Samaritan people who are mentioned in the Bible, they're real people. They're real people. When I say I'm a Samaritan, I think it's something exciting for someone to hear. The Jewish people, the Samaritan people, historically, there's only a handful of the nations that still exist and maintain any kind of semblance of identity. The most important point of the theological dispute between the Jews and the Samaritans is the location of the holy mountain. The Samaritans today are only 850 individual people, which is, is so tiny. We have this mission, really, to keep this link alive that we've almost, just almost lost. <laughs> The Jews claim that the Samaritans are newcomers, and they only arrived here 2,600 years ago. Only, yeah. Only. That's still a very long time ago. They've been observing the Israelite tradition for 2,600 years. So they are an Israelite people. The majority of the stories of the Bible took place in what we call today Judea and Samaria. If you think about sort of the map of the state of Israel, you have on the west the coastal area where the big cities are today, on the east the Jordan Valley, and all that mountainous and sort of really rugged terrain, that's Judea and Samaria. That's the heartland of the people of Israel. And up on the northern part of Samaria is where the Samaritans Mount Gerizim sits. This is the holiest of sites for the Samaritan community, and it's one of the most well-recognized places of worship in Samaria. At Mount Grizim, I met with David, an Israeli tour guide with a deep understanding of ancient peoples, especially those found in the Holy Land. Israel is an amazing society. Israel is the only Jewish state in the world, and the only country in the world that has a Jewish majority. But in Israel, we have many minorities. The Samaritans are a tiny nation. They consider themselves Israelites, descendants of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, whereas the Jews consider ourselves descendants of the Southern Kingdom of Judea. A thousand years ago, there were a million and a half Samaritans in this region. And a hundred years ago, there were less than 150 Samaritans. Today, there are 850. The community is actually growing and, and thriving today. But it is a miracle that they have succeeded 
in their surviving many wars and conquests that have taken place in this region and have maintained their culture and their faith. That is uh, truly, truly amazing. This one tiny minority outlasts everyone else. They outlasted the Jewish population for much of history, the Arabs who came and went, the Christians who came and went. They're the only ones who really remained here. When do the Samaritans date back to? That's where the dispute between the Jewish narrative and the Samaritan narrative begins. The Samaritans are a Semitic people that practice a religion very similar to Judaism. And they've maintained this practice in the Holy Land for thousands of years and their sacred language is an ancient form of Hebrew. According to Samaritan tradition, the Israelites originally built a tabernacle on Mount Grizim in the north of Israel. Then, King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem and Israel split into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom in Judea, with Jerusalem as its capital, and the northern kingdom, with Shechem or Nablus as its capital. The southern kingdom eventually became what we know as the Jewish people today, while the northern kingdom became the lost tribes of Israel, cut off from the rest of their people. The Samaritans say that they are the descendants of this northern kingdom that never really stopped worshiping on Mount Grizim. But if you ask Orthodox Judaism for their version of events, the story is slightly different. So what are we looking at, Abud? What is the significance of this place? This is really where the tabernacle of the Samaritans was built what we believe 3,650 years ago. We believe that Joshua came here and built it. So this is really the holiest point for the Samaritans. I had the privilege of exploring Mount Glizim with Abud Cohen. He comes from the Samaritan priestly tribe and has become one of the go-to guides between his people and the outside world. But he also represents the next generation of Samaritans on Mount Glizim. So when you're born as a Samaritan, the community raises you since when you were five or three years old, to even start speaking ancient Hebrew. Mm. So when you're five years or six years old, you might finish reading the Torah. By the age of eight, you already can do the bar mitzvah here. You Wait, will... so your bar mitzvah is not age dependent? It's not age dependent. By the way, Samaritan does means, well, we say shomrim, right? Which means keepers. We do believe yeah. that we are keeping what our ancestors have kept and what their ancestors have kept. The Samaritans give us a glimpse into our past. In many ways, they are a living testament to the ancient history of the Jewish and the Samaritan people here in the land. And that's what's so unique about their story, that like many other people here in the Middle East, you look at them and you can see the living testament of thousands of years of history and heritage and tradition. And that's why our connection to them is so meaningful, because we come from the same source and the same root here in this land. The Samaritans on Mount Glizim live in a village next to their holy mountain and just a short ride from Nablus in the Palestinian territories. Abud invited me to join him at their synagogue where I also met Yefet, a Samaritan priest and the brother of the high priest. Hello, hello. What a beautiful hello. place. Welcome to visit us. The Jews read, Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Ahad. The Samaritans we read like this. Shema Yisrael, Shema Elohim, Shema Ad. Samaritan religious customs are a throwback to Judaism's past, helping us understand what Jewish practice may have looked and sounded like thousands of years ago. What, what happens in this place? Like, what, what, is, what are the prayers that happen? Please. We pray art in the ground. Why? Because this is in from Prophet of Moses. All the Israelites, we pray on the ground. This is how Samaritans pray. And it's actually how we as Jews used to pray in the synagogue. There are specific points in the Jewish prayer book where we are called to bow, like the Samaritans still do today. I think that's what's special about the Samaritans is that you've never had to live as a small group outside of the country. You were always inside of the community. Yes. So the tradition always stayed the same. You never were a small minority surrounded by enemies. And you can tell because you don't have to be afraid of the tradition, you don't have to hide, you don't have to change. The similarities between Jews and Samaritans are astounding. It's not hard to believe that we were once one people worshiping the same God on different mountains. But this still does not resolve the question of if the Samaritans are part of the Jewish people. Do you define yourself Jewish or related to the Jewish people? 
or is it a separate identity that is disconnected? We believe that we are remnants of uh, the ancient Israelites who uh, entered the Holy Land 3,600 years ago. There were no Samaritans and there was no Jews. There was nothing called Samaritans. But after 450 years, there was a split. Maybe you heard about the Kingdom of Judah and Samaria, right? Yeah. And the Kingdom of Samaria was also called the Kingdom of Israel. And we believe we were a part of the Kingdom of Israel. It's a common question that we get asked, are you Israelis or are you Palestinians? And the truth is we are neither and we are both at the same time. It's, it's more complicated than people think. Technically, we do have the Palestinian and the Israeli ID. So what I like to say is that we are really kind of a link between both nations. I think we have a unique perspective of being able to see both really easily. The Samaritans are in a tough spot. Abud's community on Mount Grizim sits in disputed territory between the Israelis and Palestinians. The other community of Samaritans lives within Israel proper, just outside of Tel Aviv, and their identity is much more closely tied to the Israeli people. I went there to visit Menashe to see how they manage the complexities of being both Israeli and Samaritan. חלק מהשומרונים, כל השומרונים. השומרונים התאכלסו באזור הזה בשנת 1955. סך הכל היו בהתחלה 30 משפחות. כבר יש פה מעל 140 בתים. זו המזוזה השומרונית. זאת המזוזה. הרבה יותר גדולה מהיהודית. The mezuzah is a blessing from Deuteronomy that God commanded us to hang on the doorposts of our house. Today, Jewish mezuzahs are small and hidden inside the doorpost. Likely a result of years of persecution and keeping a low profile in the diaspora. But the Samaritan mezuzah is large and prominently placed. Perhaps the Jewish mezuzah would still look the same if we never had to hide our identity. How much time has this been going on? How many years? Thousands. How many? 3,650 years. Menashe, a proud Samaritan and Israeli, served in the IDF for 40 years. Throughout the years, and still today, He's always made time to teach ancient Hebrew to the next generation. This is how he helps preserve the heritage of his people. For you, Tomer, what, what does it mean to be Israeli? Are you first Samaritan or Samaritan Israeli? How do you look at it? First, I'm a Samaritan, then a Israeli. And do you feel the two identities collide or combine well? I don't think there is any difference. For me, Samaritan is a part of Israeli people. The Jewish people are like my brothers. Well, what is your interaction when you tell people, when you look Israeli, if such a thing existed, you look like anyone else on the street. When you tell people I'm Samaritan, yeah. what is the response? First, they are looking at me and ask, you don't look much different than I. I don't see the, the beard. Where is the hat? Where is, where is the jacket? We are the same people, eventually. So it's a natural connection. The Samaritans have always been an anomaly both throughout history and still today. I want to ask you your personal opinion. What do you think about the Samaritans? So here we see two narratives that do not connect. The Samaritans say, we are Israelites. Mm -hmm. We entered the land with Joshua. And then you have the Jewish rabbinical narrative saying, no, you guys are newcomers. You're not real Jews. And if you ask me, I think that the scholarly narrative, the third narrative, is that it's somewhere in between. It seems as if God has chosen to bless the Samaritans and sustain them in this land for thousands of years. Their history and strong bond with the Jewish people makes them simultaneously a relic of the past, a modern miracle, and an important part of Israel's future. The values are the same, the beliefs are the same. We really have a really strong connection with the Jewish people. Even in our prayers, we have this small prayer to reunite the Jewish people from all over the world to really? come to the Holy Land. Well, in ancient Hebrew, we say, you know, sometimes the Jews speak about seeking the lost tribes of Israel. So the Samaritans, they're a tiny people, but they're, they're here and they're, they're raising their hand and they're saying, hey, what about we're us? not lost, we're here.
One thing you might not expect the Samaritan community to be known for is tahini, or sesame paste. In Hebrew, we say trina. Trina is a food staple that's found in many Middle Eastern dishes. And one of Israel's most famous trina brands comes from none other than the Samaritan community on Mount Grizim. Bianco, we're standing here overlooking Nablus Shechem right yeah. next to your Very factory. Yeah. Yes. While I was on Mount Grizim, I took a trip to visit Yaakov Cohen, the owner of the Har Bracha Trina. Your Trina, Har Bracha Trina, the mountain of blessing Trina, yeah. is known throughout Israel and also internationally yeah. to be this very unique flavor. We begin to produce in 12 years, 400 kilo only, and our dream was to, to produce 2,000 kilo. Per day? Per day. Today we produce 10,000. So aside from making excellent Trina, your Haubacha, Mountain of Blessing Trina, is also known for being a unique place where you sort of are this little piece microcosmos in the factory. So in this factory, you can find small factory, let's say, Israeli people, Palestinian people, Samaritan people, and someone who gives the kosher from one settlement. I tell all the world, come to see how we live together with each other, work with each other, and eat with each other, yeah? So we have a small piece in a small factory here. Yaakov took me around his factory, and I got to see how he makes his famous trina, nice hat, while bringing Israelis and Palestinians together under one roof. We want to see the shishami, how yeah. it looks. So this is a slow roast? Slow roast. No machine can get the shishami here. Only a human, by his hand, can know it. What's your name? Uh, Muhammad. Now, what are you making here? Mixing. Sing sim and water and salt. What do you think about the fact that you work with Arabs, Samaritans, Jews in one place? Oh, it's beautiful. Really beautiful. Now that I saw the inner workings of the factory, it was time to taste the trina. Behind. Behind. Wow, that is amazing. Creating a space where Jews, Muslims, Christians, and Samaritans can work together in harmony is a big part of Yaakov's vision. I told you we have a small bit here, mm -hmm. and you can see here by three languages, Trina Shumronit, Tahir al-Jabal al Har and he's received some pretty impressive recognition for his efforts. You have prizes and awards that have flags from different countries, but specifically Palestinian and Israeli. You don't see many businesses anywhere that have awards from the Palestinian Authority, and at the same time, from, you have, what is that, the military academy, yeah. the Israeli military academy, the police, and you know multiple government agencies. Yeah. So it just shows how much the business connects people. So then there's something also very interesting. Yeah. This is quite an award. So I'll just translate what it says. Yeah. This is a Forbes award for, it's called Small Giants, for the small businesses that make a big change. And the Har Yeah. That's a great pride. I think what's beautiful is, is that everything connects. So it's not only a good product, but on top of that, you're connecting communities and people. You know, you're, you're really making a difference. It's not just another business, it's something that's doing something meaningful and bringing some true change to the world. Yeah, if that give you a feedback, a good feedback, that will do something good for the world, for your community, for your country. So we are here, here small giant, but I hope to be a big giant in the future. Big giant to make something good for the world. Shalom. With us today is Sharon Regev. Sharon Regev is from the Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs. Shalom, Sharon, and welcome to our show. Shalom. You have a very unique job at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Can you tell us about it? I think I have the best job in the, the ministry. The best job, okay. So it's not only unique. <laughs> in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'm the director of the Department for World Religions. Israel has many minorities. Of course. So here in the Holy Land, we have 9.3 million inhabitants. 75% mm -hmm. of them are Jews. About 1.8 million are Muslims. And among them, you have different groups. And then you have about uh, 170,000 Christians. And we are blessed to have this abundance mm -hmm. of uh, faiths and religions, and they enrich our life, they enrich our culture. When you look at the state of minorities in neighboring countries, they are oppressed, they are persecuted. When you compare Israel 
you realize that the freedom of religion and freedom of worship that it is committed to is something that one should not take for granted. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that this commitment started from the minute of the creation of the state of Israel, when our first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, mm -hmm. read the declaration of the establishment of the state of Israel. The first thing that he said is that Israel is committed to provide freedom of religion, freedom of worship to all its inhabitants, regardless of their faith, regardless of their religious background, mm -hmm. regardless of their background in general. When we look in on Bethlehem, the number of Christian people is dropping and dropping and dropping. And here, the Christian communities are flourishing. Thank God for that, yes. So, as you said, when you look around us, when you look, for example, at the demographics of Bethlehem, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. It used to be 85% Christian. Christian. Today, the numbers talk about 15%. And we know that when you look at the numbers here in Israel, the Christian minority, they are the best well-to-do sector here in Israel, more than the Jewish sector, more than the Muslim sector and others. Sharon, this episode has to do with the Samaritan. We're talking about the Samaritans. I'd love to know how the state of Israel sees them and you in your role, what's your relationship with the Samaritan people? They are such an interesting religious group, you know, they're very ancient people. And we read also in the New Testament about Definitely. the uh, Good Samaritan. And they've been here since time and memoria, right? Me, myself, I was blessed to join them in some of their uh, Ceremony. ancient ceremonies. And really, I want to invite all our viewers to come during Shavuot, Pentecost, to see uh, their pilgrimage to Mount Gerizim. They read in the Bible, and it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. You were born here in the land. You have a very unique job. Do you have something special you want to tell our viewers around the world? Something as an Israeli? that they should come and visit the Holy Land and they should see, first of all, this beautiful, fascinating mosaic of people from different faiths and from different backgrounds. When you come here and when you read scripture, you see all the commands from Leviticus that tell us that we have to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. You see them materialize in front of your own eyes. Mm. Sharon, thank you very much. Thank you, my pleasure. And to you, our friends, once again, thank you from Jerusalem. Thank you for joining us as we provide a spiritual insight of what God is doing in Israel and in the Middle East. If you want to learn more about what God is doing in Israel, make sure to visit us on our webpage and follow us on social media. Shalom, and God bless you from Jerusalem.